Yeah, thanks a lot, Kenko. Uh, hi, this is Deb. So I lead the machine learning platform team at Create Karma. And I have with me Raj and Nick. Uh, Nick leads the machine learning infrastructure team. And Raj is our uh, architect for the machine learning platform. And we have Vishnu with us as well, who is the VP of our org. And uh, we, we are from the data science and engineering team and the title of the talk is uh, Vega which is our machine learning platform and how we have made uh, how we have made use of uh, Apache Airflow to unify all our machine learning workflows at Credit Karma and what did we get the benefits out of it. Uh, the outline of the talk at a high level what I will spend some time on why we built Vega and then uh, Nick will take over and he is going to go deeper into what is Vega and he will do a deep dive on the training data. How did we build training data with Vega? And then after that, Raj will take up the deep dive uh, on setting up the machine learning infrastructure with Vega. We'll spend some time on the data science application that we power with it. And then we, we are going to end the talk with the key takeaways and the future work. Uh, why Vega? Before we jump into what Vega is, I think I wanted to spend some time on why did we build Vega? Why did we uh, plan? Why did we build a platform that will uh, unify all our machine learning workflows? And we'll spend some time on that. So at Eight Karma, uh, we ch champion the fi financial for progress for more than 120 million members that we have. And we give a very personalized experience to all our members uh, through various financial offers that we recommend to them. We also show a personalized feed based on the financial content to our members, which we call as stories. And then we also send them notifications, mail, push notifications, and those are personalized as well. And all these personalized experiences, right? They are all driven by data and models at scale. So it is data and models and machine learning. This is very important for us. And it is very important to personalize the experience for our members. Now, uh, if we will spend some little time to know about how we typically build the models at Create Karma. So at a high level, we get this bureau data for the members, uh, bureau is something like your credit reports uh, that we get for all of our member. And then we also get a lot of behavioral data, like how the member is interacting with our application. We get all that data and that becomes our training data set. And then this training data, we send it to power our training, um, uh, training methods. And then typically we make use of booster trees for cases where we have to kind of explain uh, what sort of rec recommendations we are doing. And then we also make use of neural nets. And these are all the uh, AI models, which is which we build on top of the data that we get. Now, once we get all the models built and when a new user comes with, with its own credit history, credit profile, we take this new data, we power it through our runtime machine learning model, and then we generate the predictions from them. Now, these predictions are critical to power the story, marketplaces, and emails. So we make use of this model prediction to find the most relevant, the most uh, uh, relevant content for our members at at all the channels. So story was the personalized news feed that we have for each member marketplace. This is where we show our financial offers and then notifications where we send mails to our members. Now, if we uh, spend some time on like to see that how uh, the evolution of personalization looked at credit karma. So we have been building models for quite a long time. So I, in, in the axis, I show you a timeline. So the very first models that we have built was we started building them from 2014. And those models, we call them as certainty model. These models try to find out which financial offer are these members most likely to get. 
Now, as in the, the timeline when we came to 2017, we start to find out that which we start to build this targeting models, which kind of captures that what offers does the member want. Now, as we go more after that, we started building this engagement model that how do we send email? How do we send the push notification to the member so that we increase the engagement? Then after that, we start to build some sort of propensity model that out of our cards, personal loan, auto, home, uh, di different verticals that we have, uh, which uh, vertical is the member is most interested in. Then we then at that time uh, in the 2019, 2020 time frame is where we started to build this personalized feed on our application where we start to show the personalized uh, engagement content to our member and we call it stories. So now uh, the problem came that how do we find out the lifetime value for each of the story, right? So if we show an engagement content to our member, how much value does the uh, member bring to us? So th that's where we start to build this lifetime value models. Then, um, Something which was recently 2020, we got a lot of benefits from this, where we started to build this member understanding model. So we know what was the past member income was, but, but then we don't know what is his future, future income, what is his future borrowing power. So we started to build some specific model to find out the member's future income, borrowing power, how much money can you borrow from a loan. And these models have been very useful. Now, 2021, where uh, as our personalized feed content increased and it become more and more interesting. So we started to look into this embedding models that can help us to find if the content is relevant for our members and recommend such content. And then uh, 2021 is the time where our CK money uh, savings and checking this product launched. And then we start. Hello, everybody. Uh, sorry about that technical issue. Apparently, one of the spe our speakers, Deb, uh, lost connection. We hope he's OK. We are not being able to reach him right now, but we hope he's OK. And we let you know if he's OK. Um, hopefully, he can join in a bit. But in the meantime, this presentation actually had three parts. So we're going to continue with our next section which is led by uh, Nicholas Pataki. So Nick, please carry on. Hi guys. So my name is Nick Pataki. Deb uh, just had a bit of a network issue. I think what we'll do is we'll skip forward to my section of the talk. Uh, what he was about to get into is actually quite interesting. So we'll have enough time and hopefully his network uh, computer will reboot and we'll bring him in towards the end to help wrap up things. But for now, what I want to do is I want to go over uh, what is Vega. First off, uh, I'm Nick, as I just introduced. I'm an engineering manager within the recommendation system uh, organization here at Credit Karma, and we call it Rexus for short. And I have been a Karma Nod actually since 2018, and I started as an individual contributor with the machine learning infra team, which I now help manage. And as Deb was kind of referring to uh, before, our initial mandate was to build the next generation machine learning platform for Credit Karma to address many of the scaling and standardization issues that Deb was going to reference. This is leading directly to responding to the reason for why um, we have introduced a unified framework for machine learning. And for us, this meant one, designing and writing Vega, building it, and also two, setting up the machine learning infra that would scale with the company. And I did this with Deb, with Raj, and a number of others in the team. Initially, we were quite small about four of us. We've grown almost 4x over the last four years, and we have varying sub, -pod, uh, sub teams or pods now with different specialties. And as I was saying in the beginning, my objective here is just to help give you an overview on what exactly Vega is and how it relates uh, and makes use of Airflow. So in short, Vega is our model development kit. It's written in Python. It provides a unified framework for four things, for feature, engin uh, feature engineering, for training data generation, for model building and for model deployment. And all of these components come with a bunch of added features like data quality, centralized metadata, 
continuous model refreshing that Raj will actually get into quite a bit uh, towards the end of the talk. The neat thing here is that everything that we do pretty much right now is powered by Airflow workflows. When we uh, sat down to design uh, Vega, we had four principles guide our development. One was that we wanted to use open source standards wherever possible. And I've gone ahead and highlighted in blue areas where Apache Airflow would actually support our principles. So here it's that we wanted to use Apache Airflow for scheduling our data and our training workflows. Turns out we figured out that we can actually use it for pretty much everything that we do. Uh, we are a Google shop here. So we wanted to actually use Google Cloud AI services uh, to address some of the scaling issues that we had seen for compute and training, for scoring, a whole host of things. And for this, we actually have a future effort coming up to do a Cloud Composer uh, for hosted Airflow. We actually manage our own infra, our own nodes, and our own Airflow right now. And the third was that we wanted to provide unified machine learning workflows for our data scientists. These are basically Python APIs that uh, could run from notebooks or on local scripts that could be deployed into Airflow DAGs via CICD, continuous integration um, and deployment, and uh, run on Airflow nodes. And the final thing is we just wanted to kind of employ the efficient and most optimal machine learning engineering practices. And you'll see this when Raj gets a little bit into how we do automated refresh on our Airflow. Now, in the next section after this, I'm going to do a drill down, a little bit of a deep dive on um, how we build up training data. But first, what I want to do is help everyone who's here at the talk today get oriented on some of the main Vega classes that the team and data scientists leverage at the company for each component or step, excuse me, for each uh, component or step of a workflow. Now for engineering, uh, for feature engineering, we employ two classes or three actually, but I've just got two highlighted here, uh, query processor and Scala processor. So a QP is pretty much a wrapper for BigQuery compute and a Scala processor is a wrapper for Dataflow Compute, which is leveraging the Apache Beam framework, another open source standard um, that allows people to write in Scala or Java. For model training, uh, we wanted to support multiple frameworks here. So like TensorFlow, Scikit, XGBoost, LGB, uh, and we do this on AI platform. For model analysis, which uh, requires scoring, computing metrics, this is aggregation on scores, uh, and making uh, graduation decisions, we uh, use pipeline processor, which again is just a wrapper for data flow, but uh, this is uh, allows people to write Python UDF. And then our refresh in infrastructure, which is really, I think some of the most interesting part of what we do here is uh, what we're talking about today is uh, we employ or wrote something called a Vega compiler, similar in many ways to original Google data lab uh, library. For those of you who are familiar with that, the workflow generator, but we basically use Vega compiler to do a few things. We use it to one chain Vega processors using client specified syncs and sources into the correct dependency graph uh, to translate Vega processors into airflow operators. I'm gonna show you some of that in a bit. And then to return an airflow DAG, which can be run. It also is pretty neat here that all of these classes uh, can be run in an interactive mode, which will allow a developer or a data scientist or uh, anybody basically to kind of run these things in local or cloud mode, but you could also deploy them. And that means converting them to Airflow code. We also support right now feature, uh, feature and model monitoring, uh, managing all of our artifacts and all of this is done with various processes as well. And finally, this is actually out of scope for the talk, but those of you who are familiar with the machine learning space uh, or like machine learning platform, we do also support the scoring, uh, the serving uh, uh, components online. Um, we do some model scoring. There's another team that handles this. Uh, and then we actually have model monitoring uh, where we use a pipeline processor as well. So now that I've kind of oriented you on the components of a machine learning workflow, the basic kind of components of what we do here uh, and the classes that support that, I want to try, uh, drill down a bit and show you how we build training data up. All right, so those of you who are so inclined, this is probably when you're taking a quick snapshot but of the screen, but don't worry, we will uh, we'll come back to this again. Um, I'm actually, this is a fairly kind of a high level overview of how we build training data at Credit Karma. Uh, I'm going to step through this a little bit carefully, step by step, um, to help you understand what we're doing here. 
But basically, this graph helps us support forward fill uh, and backfill. So forward fill is just set at airflow on some cadence, daily, hourly, or whatnot. Um, backfill is uh, triggered. It's a little bit meta in that we have DAGs that manage backfill DAGs, uh, backfill DAGs that manage our actual workflow DAGs. But these uh, will allow us to put on new features uh, and backfill the training data uh, to apply bug fixes and patches, and they're triggered on demand. So now I'm going to step through this flow a bit. So let's think first here about uh, something we call algorithmic facts. Uh, these are model scores as features. The point here is I want to help kind of build up the feature store and then build up a modeling data store. And so one of the things we could do is we could have a family of models, like uh, Deb was referencing earlier, that say they predict the intent of one of our members to apply for a mortgage, let's say, or a car loan. Now, this feature could actually be used by another model, the Cascade uh, set of models. We could even actually use it for, on the online system for filtering rank, uh, and uh, ranking. But basically, we use pipeline processors to define a scoring ETL. And let me show you how this works, OK? So on the left, what we have is a pipeline processor. The uh, signature should look pretty familiar. It's in Python. Uh, it takes data syncs. It expresses some data source. It takes a process function. So this is going to be Apache Beam Python code uh, that um, we pass along to the data flow service. And then a config for configuring that data flow job. And the API I'm showing below is actually more extensive than what's shown. But for our purposes here, we're just really interested in two things. One, that we can execute. And we can execute this processor um, in interactive mode on a particular timestamp, which allows us to handle data leakage uh, point in time. Uh, and then also, we can run it in different modes. The second uh, method here is something called update tasks. This is a little bit, uh, it could actually probably be private. But this is a contract that the compiler, uh, our Vega compiler, requires. And it basically converts the class into a dictionary, uh, dictionary and allows us to update a graph that the Vega compiler uses. We'll show you what this looks like a little bit later. And on the right here is what the corresponding Airflow operator looks like for this processor once it's been compiled. Now, I've filled in a little bit more information. Um, some of you should be able to see this. You can see that this is a compute operator. For us, it's kind of like our base Airflow operator. Uh, it has a compute type. There could be many. It could be BQ, Scala, local Python. Here, it's Dataflow, AI engine, let's say, or AI platform. It has sources. In this case, notice there's some Avro data we're pulling from somewhere and a model. It specifies a sync and a whole bunch of other um, parameters. Uh, one of the things that I want to kind of point out here is that note that on the left, the client of ours has control over the pipeline processor and everything that they may need in order to kind of define some uh, step in our ETL. But uh, MLEng and MLI, uh, they own the Vega source code. And we own the compute operator. We own the compiler. And so it actually allows us to um, add things like standardized callback functions. If you see that on failure callback, about five or six parameters down. Or let's say force owners um, to be specified. Uh, and all of this can be included downstream for alerting when these ML workflows um, fail or these particular tasks fail or succeed. And this is a nice, neat kind of trick that allows us to standardize the workflow. And it actually gets our data scientists and analysts out of the way of having to deal with any of this, really. OK, so now that I've got you kind of oriented on what model scoring looks like, uh, let's show you how we build an offline feature store. This is the next component that you need to build training data. So we use query processors. Right, And you can see on the left up top here, I have uh, some data scientists or analysts. They're defining a bunch of SQL. And then in this green box uh, where there's a little airflow symbol, we've got a bunch of QPs. Uh, these basically are just doing a whole bunch of SQL transfer, uh, SQL compute. And then given the scale of features that we have for our members, we're north of 40, 50K, um, uh, 50,000 features. We don't, we don't join um, in BQ anymore. So what we've actually done is moved over to Dataflow, and we have a joiner there. So it's a pipeline processor. Um, and we actually use that for our export uh, as well, which could uh, export the feature store in basically different formats. Like our online serving system and production requires one format, um, maybe nested, maybe not nested. Our, our offline feature store are many sets of tables in BQ. 
So let's see what this actually looks like in code, kind of like what I did for the modeling score, okay? Uh, for the, uh, the uh, model scores. So basically we have SQL everywhere. One of the reasons why we use this, it's just, it's a really well understood and stable language. It really democratizes access to feature engineering. Note that up here in the right, um, I'm just kind of, uh, it's kind of a, you know, uh, a, a foo kind of a SQL, but basically just uh, we're pulling some model scores um, and we're exporting a couple of features, model score and a model foo intent. Uh, and then notice in the bottom right that we're pulling features about items. Those of you familiar with this can uh, understand that feature stores have different entities. So some of them may be for our members, some of them may be for items. And here it looks like we're just pulling a bunch of text data around something that we call Karma Catalog Editorials. So how does this work when we want to translate this into, a uh, client wants to translate this into a query processor, and then we want to translate it to Airflow code. So again, we have a query processor on the left. Uh, the signature is looking fairly familiar. And uh, we have the same API, uh, execute and update tasks. The neat thing about this QP, we don't use it as much anymore, but the API is even more extensive. Um, it used to support or it does support query validation, sampling data on that SQL, and then even computing statistics on selected features if you want to run this in interactive mode. Uh, and then on the right, we have this BQ execute operator. That is basically the reflected airflow operator for a query processor. And you note once again, it's all the same kind of parameters. Uh, a mode, sources, syncs, the SQL, a bunch of uh, stuff that MLI pushes through like on failure callback functions and owners. So let's go ahead and put this all together. I've now kind of helped you see how we can build up model scores and define um, a bunch of pipeline processors to do that. We can also build up uh, a bunch of query processors to do uh, a feature store. Let's see what this actually looks like in a single Airflow DAG. Now, so this is uh, pseudocode, but it really is basically the same Vega code and runner that we use to build up our feature and modeling data store DAGs. It is a, uh, you'll notice here that under the main, uh, basically a uh, workflow is just a list of processors. Uh, here we've got a bunch of, we've got a pipeline processor and a bunch of query processors, and they're all appended into a list. And then that's simply passed to a compiler um, the compiler, we're not going to show all that code here, but it is kind of the secret sauce that constructs the topologically sorted graph using all the processor sinks and sources. It then translates each processor into the op airflow operator, constructs the workflow, and then returns a string, what we're calling airflow spec. And then that is just simply sent up to some file system, whether it's remote or local, that an airflow server can sync on. And now we can build up our modeling data store. I'm gonna move a little bit quickly through here, but essentially the pattern should be very similar, uh, should be very familiar. We really use the same approach as building our feature store. It's just a set of queries uh, using a, a set of query processors uh, that are configured by data scientists and MLEng. Uh, the difference here for building training data is that we need a bunch of other sources. Uh, we need some online responses. These are labels. We need our Rexus logs, if you note that these are actually processed uh, and ETL using Vega processors as well. Um, and then uh, you need the feature store. And then what we do is we just compile that into an Airflow graph, similar to what I just showed you, and we get something like this. So this is actually uh, one of our modeling data store DAGs exactly. It constructs two sets of modeling stores, one for stories, which Deb referenced earlier, and another for something that we called offers. And uh, we thank Airflow because it manages all the complexity of our dependencies and literally just allows us to kind of point and click to replay, run daily when we need put, put patches on and replay data. It's just really as simple as a point and click usually. So uh, the, the last thing I want to point out actually here before I uh, pass it off to Raj is that you notice that our offline feature store and our training data store um, they also have data quality and metadata. These are powered by pri pipeline processors. Some of the statistics that are computed require large passes over data. And then also QPs um, for computing like simple statistics in SQL. And basically all of this is again, powered on Airflow. Uh, these jobs run hourly, um, they run daily uh, for all various kinds of data around the company. And uh, the logs are basically connected to Looker, PagerDuty and Slack for alerts. 
And you know, basically that's it. Uh, right now at Airflow at Credit Karma, we basically use Airflow everywhere, uh, and we thank you for that. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Raj to discuss our infra in a little bit more detail. Uh, thanks, Nick. Hi, uh, my name is Raj Katakam. So I'm a machine learning engineer with the recommendation systems of the Credit Karma. So I have been a Credit Karma not since 2018, and I'm fortunate to have been a part of the founding team of this particular platform and play, a, play my part in its role towards driving an impact. So my colleague, Nick, has just introduced us to the core uh, segments which power uh, feature stores and training data, right? So taking things from there, my objective is in this section is to help give an overview of DS experimentation and production workflows with machine learning models per se as the priority. Right. So as a small refresher, like I want to go over DS journey with Vega. Right? So DS comes in and then as part of their workflow or experiments, which they would want to do, they commit different types of processors as a list and based on actions they want to perform. Right. So like, you know, for SQL kind of transformations, you have query processor for data flow or like, you know, TensorFlow transform or like, you know, uh, like uh, pandas transformations, like any of these transformations, you have uh, pipeline processors. And then, if we were to train some estimators, like let it be like you know, scikit estimators or TensorFlow estimators or deep neural networks, boosted tools. So all of these are, are are done in model processor, and each of these are actually like you know, being uh, uh, powered by Google products, like. Query processor is with Google BigQuery, and then you have a uh, pipeline processor on Dataflow, and then you have a uh, model processor on Google AI platform per se, so that they can scale individually all by themselves. So process, if you think about it, process are the building blocks of Vega. As such, DS can execute each processor individually in an interactive fashion for their experimentation. But once they are comfortable with the experimentation, within a couple of lines of code, you can compile them all together as a production workflow and we can deploy, deploy them on Airflow. So as such, like, you know, uh, it, it removes a lot of gap between experimentation and production and Airflow is a, like, you know, key thing which manages all these pipelines and all these processes and interactions between them in, in uh, like, you know, uh, uh, in Airflow, like, uh, yeah. So, now, like you know, now that we have a top level idea of what Vega is, I want to like you know go over what, how a typical machine learning pipeline looks, right? Right. So if you think about it, data science actually starts when they're training data, and they would obviously would want to do some sorts of SQL transformations on top of it. Like they would want to filter the, some of the data, or they would want to upsample some of the data, or downsample some of the data, or wrangle some of the data. So for that, you have a query processor, say, and then once you have those transformations done, you might want to do some imputations on data. Like these, these transformations are like, you know, very specific to the models per se. So if I want to train booster trees, then I would not do any kinds of in imputation. But if I would want to do neural networks, I might want to do some neural net, uh, some imputations. I might want to do some, uh, zero one normalization or z score normalization there could be n number of things your world is the playground if you would want to do types of transformations right and for that we have pp or pipeline processor and then once after you have done with pre-processing you would want to do some model building or estimator training and all so once you have that done you would want to analyze models and 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 like you know uh, what we, and one magical thing which you would want to do in an ideal world is auto model refresh right which we have in place which we have tools in place for it so what auto model refresh means is that like you know obviously over the time the models get stale and like you know you would want to capture the latest seasonal behavior without actually changing the definition of the model right as in when the new data is coming in you would want to refresh that particular model based on some sort of metric you want to like you know update those particular models right so that is auto model refresh capability so once you have that in place also you would want to like you know uh, push that in production and for us like you know the serving ecosystem is prophecy which i don't think we'll i'll, I'll uh, we'll get into much in this particular talk but after that you would obviously once it goes into production you would want to monitor that particular models for any kind of degradations or issues right 
so all of these as such like you know are like you know uh, are, can be plugged into this vega framework quite easily and effectively and once you have experimented a bunch of things on top of it within like one or two lines of code you can compile them and you can get a airflow dag and these are like you know powering all our uh, production ecosystems right so now in this now that we have an idea of what ml pipeline looks like i want to like you know go over each individual block and then talk a bit on how the inputs look like from data science perspective and what's coming out of that particular system right so here in this slide i want to show you if a data science wants to run some a simple query they just uh, use query processor for it and here they are just doing here is a simple example where you would want to upsample uh, uh, ones and downsample zeros like you know the labels usually in classifier and recommendation systems use cases you have labels very less labels so data science typically tends to do this so these kind of transformations or any filters or any sql kind of transformation sql query processor is the one uh, which data science leverages and uh, yeah so uh, uh, so like you know uh, once you data science one they can obviously interactively experiment with it and once they are okay they can just like you know one or two lines you get a flow dag so in a similar fashion like you know once that is done it is here is one simple example for tensorflow transformations which we do which we which data science do, does using pipeline processor right so if they plug in this particular piece of code in the pipeline processor ecosystem there uh, like you know this 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 graph gets generated and plugs and is plugged into like you know production models per se so what this one is doing is it's just doing imputing it's just imputing nulls with zeros in tensorflow world and it's dumps out a graph per se right so yeah there could be n number of transformations which they would want to do based on models types of models and all and like you know there could be z scores or zero one normalization its world is your playground to do a bunch of things on top of this right so uh, and then once you are done with uh, pre processing and transformations like obviously you would want to define models right you would want to give model definitions so all data science has to do is data science just has to write a class definition which uh, like you know either gives out a tensorflow estimator or gives out a scikit pipeline per se and rest of the ecosystem vega ecosystem takes care of all the pieces together right so in this particular example i'm showing how a deep neural network is simply trained like you know it's a uh, 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 so with small definition file a class your data science can productionize their models and experiment with them as well so what model processor pretty much does is it trains the models and dumps the model in an appropriate location uh, for serving systems to consume right so now that model training is done here comes the game changer piece right so i, I was talking about refreshing the models like you know without uh, for attributing to seasonal changes in distributions right so accommodate for changing data distributions we have auto model refresh based on metrics which we calculate on latest data we can define model refresh logic via config so if you see on your left you have a promote model uh, section the metric which we will be using for promoting like you know that you can use any kind of metric but the metric which we use is like you know uh some uh, in some of the pipelines is log loss so if at all the latest model which you have trained on this particular day is like you know better than uh the log loss of this model is better than the previous one you just take an action without actually human in loop uh you you do a deployment of this particular model so and once deployed you get an alert which is on your right corner you see that amr task successfully finished and this one just says that log loss of this current model is 0.128552 which is better than the one which is in production though marginally better but the whole point is that there is no human in loop for automatically refreshing models per se right so so with so uh, once that is done like you know with the same pipeline processor ecosystem ds has the capability to now define alerts in production as well so towards the left you have model uh, model metrics where you are actually like you know uh, uh, calculating average precision of the models in every couple of hours 
and then checking if if model is degrading in any sense. And towards the right, you have feature stability index. So what feature stability is is that we would want to check the, the uh, differences in distribution while when you are training versus while when you are scoring, right? So if there is some difference, if there are some red flags in any of these metrics, it gives us uh, like, you know, uh, a trigger that something is wrong either in the pipeline or something is wrong uh, so, or something has changed altogether seasonally. So it gives a like, you know, trigger that we have to dig deeper into so into like you know the pipelines and then how the mo into models are uh, like you know in the whole ecosystem yes so now coming here like you know now that we have introduced and we have seen some examples of how these processes are working so coming here we see that all these processes we talk together are actually sitting together nicely in this example i have taken one example which data science has written processes for the whole pipeline here in this part in this pipeline Two models are getting trained. Two models have auto model refresh enabled on them, and two models have like you know model monitoring enabled on it. So you see that you see the complicated structure we are ending up with, right? So the main idea here is that it is completely self-serve. No engineer is ever touching this particular system. It's all in the data science hands. They are writing a bunch of processes, and boom, you're getting this uh, to just productionize it. Two lines, it gets into production and uh, Airflow is doing all the heavy lifting for us in that particular section. Uh, it's managing all these, like, you know, pipelines per se, right? Like, you know, it's managing the dependencies and also it is giving us callbacks to, like, you know, to tell us, okay, something, some pipeline has gone bad or, like, you know, something has failed, you have to take an action. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it, engineer is completely out of the loop in the whole of this ecosystem. So now that we have seen machine learning pipelines, right? So I want to like, you know, do a quick segue into uh, some of the applications of machine learning mod machine learning models, which we have at CK, right? So one, one is like, you know, models for selecting campaigns. So I'll just like, you know, uh, 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 talk through the, this, like, you know, the obvious trade karma sends out a bunch of emails to users, right? So our goal is to give proper financial products to appropriate financial products to the users and uh, to help them grow in their financial journey, right? In, uh, so they, at every step from like, you know, sending an email, you have probabilities and models associated like, you know, uh, for every action which the user is going to take, right? So if an email is sent, you have probability that he might open it. If he opens it, that there is a chance, there is a good probability that he's going to see the landing page on which he's going to see offers. So if he sees an offer, what is the probability that he's going to apply for it? And if he applies, what is the probability that he's going to get approved for it? If you see this whole funnel, right, each individual step has some sort of fuzzy uh, probability pieces to it. And all of these decisions, all of these are actually like, you know, machine learning models per se, which help us target, give targeted and personalized uh, content to the users. So similar is this case for uh, in-app application, in-app for uh, like, you know, behavior as well. So whenever a user comes onto the platform, he sees a bunch of offers. So for once he sees it, there is an impression to click probability that, okay, once he sees it, what's the property that he's going to click on? Once he clicks on it, what is the property that he's going to apply for it? Once he applies for it, what is the property that he's going to get converted for it? All of these are also machine learning models. Obviously, there are like other pieces which uh, Deb has initially talked about. Like uh, there are a bunch of other models, but these are like you know directly getting correlated with what user is taking an action on. So it, this this kind of gives an idea of how personalization is happening per se at CK from a top level, right? So I. From that, I want to like you know segue that into this particular piece that how this Vega ecosystem and Vega combined with work Airflow ecosystem is helping us in our day-to-day -day pieces and how it's how it has performed over the previous world we had. So previously, like you know, if we were to onboard a user per se, it used to take one week from the data perspective. Uh, more, uh, but now within a day, like you know, uh, the data flows in for that particular user, and these that particular data is available for training or any any of the pieces downstream. 
So if at all data science has to make a new model per se, previously in 2018, before 2018, it used to take more than a month, approximately two months or something like that, uh, to create a new model and deploy it to production. But now within a few days, you're done with it. Like, you know, uh, from experimentation cycle to production cycle, it hardly takes two or three days per se. So, and then you have uh, training data dependencies as well. Thanks to Airflow, actually, in this particular section, because we have a plethora of data sources and, like, you know, managing the dependencies between each individual piece to make training data is was a bit of a hassle back then. And it used to take a bunch of uh, so many hours to get one snapshot of training data for data science. But now it's, it's all automated per se, like, you know, data science gives us. Uh, yeah, I mean, within ten min within like you know ten minutes, we have uh, uh, the data available. So, so like you know, compared to two thousand eighteen, we see that we see that we have twenty x more features deployed. We have seven hundred seven hundred plus models deployed in production, and we have like you know seven x experiments running all together live in in, in our uh, ecosystem. So, like the key t- takeaways from this talk is. Uh, that like you know uh, this Vega platform is helping us in bunch of sections. It is helping us catalog raw data. It is a data science frame infrastructure like you know which helps to develop uh, like you know models in any kind of framework like TensorFlow or, and all of TensorFlow or Scikit and all of these are kind of like you know uh, uh, easy easy to use from experimentation and production perspective. So from future work perspective, I think like you know there are uh, so from future work perspective, they're like, you know, obviously Nick has talked on it a bit. So we have uh, uh, we have Airflow hosted, we have Airflow hosted on our own VMs. We would want to leverage Cloud Composer for it. And TFX, we have, we have seen that it has a really good uh, uh, component management system. So uh, like, you know, we would want to leverage and integrate with TFX and deploy TFX on Airflow and use logs, Composer logs for metrics and uh, monitoring, yeah. So that's pretty much is the talk. And uh, yeah, and like, you know, I wanted to highlight we are hiring as well. So we have exciting opportunities in recommendation systems and uh, fraud detection space. Uh, please go ahead and, uh, like, you know, uh, have a look at those. That's it.